When I am down and oh my soul so weary, when troubles come and my heart burden be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and see. While with me, you raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulder. you will answer this question before you leave this room this morning. Where does your strength come from? If you have your Bibles, would you take them out with me this morning? 
and turn to Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18. And I'm going to ask you if you are physically able, would you please stand with me as I read our Father's Word? We're going to pick up Psalm chapter 18 in verse 1. Here David says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today because we know we need you. There are people in this room this morning who probably do not have a relationship with you. There are people viewing us online this morning, maybe perhaps those sitting in the parking lot, who do not have a relationship with you. I pray, Father, by the end of this service, in just a few moments, as they answer this question, and I pray they will do so honestly. Where does my strength come from? As we look at David's words this morning. Father, I ask you to bind Satan and his minions from this place. From every place around the globe where your children have come together to worship you. I pray this morning, Jesus, that you would be Lord in this room. That you would touch needs and move hearts and reassure minds. Holy Spirit, I ask you to teach this morning. Speak. Please. We need a word from you. And so, Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So let's look at this text together. Where does your strength come from? There are three keys that I want you to see in these verses that I just read. The first key is your commitment to God. Now let's look at the setting for this song because the setting is very important. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 22. It's years before. And David has just been delivered by God from his enemies. And in this setting, realizing that he is no longer a wanted man, he pens the words in 2 Samuel 22. Years later, he rewrites these words. It's almost verbatim from the original song that he wrote to the Lord. And he writes what I've just read and the rest of Psalm 18 for the nation of Israel to lead them in public worship. And so he shares his heart with God. Let me just kind of set the stage for you so you understand what's happening in this man's life and maybe it will give you more value. So here's the scene. King Saul of Israel is jealous of David. God's hand of blessing is on David and Saul sees it. Saul wants it, but he doesn't decide to walk with God. And his jealousy for David grows. And so it gets to a point where he says, I'm going to kill this man. Now, to help you understand the gravity of this, this would be like Donald Trump, the President of the United States, unleashing the CIA, the DEA, the FBI, local, state, and federal police officers, and unleashing them saying, I want you to find David, and when you do, bring him to me because I'm going to kill him. He has no place to hide. He's on the run. He's a nomad. He and the men who are with him, they hide in caves. They hide in the mountains. They hide in the desert. They're hiding everywhere. And he has personal enemies that hate him also because he's such a valiant soldier. Every battle he leads, he wins. And they hate him for it. He has no friends. No one to trust. No one to go to. He is on the run. Public enemy number one. 
Now let's look at the song as we now have set the stage and let's see what he says. He says in verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Where do you go when things are bad? Where do you hide? Where do you stand? Look at David. David says here, I love you, my Lord. It is the word Yahweh, Yehovah. He is talking to the self-existent, eternal God. You see, David knows who God is. Do you? Is your relationship with God so real you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? My former pastor's wife would always say it this way. Do you know that you know that you know he's got it? David says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Let's look at verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. You see, David chose to love God. Do you? See, it's easy to say you love God when things are good. It's another thing to say you love God when things are not good. David's a wanted man. God has just delivered David from his enemies. Saul is now dead. He was killed in the battle with the Philistines. His enemies have now been vanquished. And they have faded away. And David, realizing what has taken place, writes this psalm. This song to God. And he thanks God for God's deliverance to him. For him. See, he chose to take refuge in God. Look at verse 2 with me. Notice how he describes God. God is the very strength that David stands upon. He is my fortress. He knows that God defends him, protects him, watches over him. He is my deliverer, David writes. He is my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. Now, that word refuge in the Hebrew has about six meanings. I want to share three of them with you. Here it means that he knows God has protected and will protect him. I want to encourage you today. Know that God will protect you. He is a God that he takes refuge in and he trusts. How much do you trust your God? How much do you trust our Heavenly Father? And he is a God that David hopes in. He takes refuge in. This is the battle line. For every Christian today. In our culture, in our times right now, it is so important for us to remember the God that we serve. David has literally drawn a line in the sand, and he is standing on that line, and he is saying, Yehovah is God. So look at the text with me, and I want to show you here our mission. Our vision. I've been asked a lot. Now that you're our pastor, Mike, what's our mission? I will give it to you in two simple verses. Matthew 4.19, Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 4.19, Jesus says, follow me. Folks, we're going to do that together. We're going to help each other learn. We're going to encourage each other, stand with each other, and we're going to be obedient to the commands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second, Jesus said, make disciples. We're going to go into our community. We're going to tell people that God loves them. Is there a virus? Yes, there is. But our God is large and He is in control. And we're going to go because this is the moment God has given the church to proclaim the truth. We're going to go into our community and proclaim the truth. We're going to meet people's needs. And when God saves them, we're going to baptize them in that little pool back there or in the lake we can find, whatever's convenient. And then we're going to come alongside them and we're going to teach them how to have a relationship with God and do this thing called life with God. That's our mission. And that's what we're going to do for as long as I have breath and as long as I'm your pastor, we're going to live right there. We're going to get good at it. We're going to become experts at it. And our community is going to see it. And they're going to come and find out what in the world's happened at Kathleen Baptist Church. And we're going to smile and bring them in and sit them down and love on them. And we're going to share Jesus with them. Amen. That's all we're going to do. We're just going to stay right there. Our vision, how are we going to do this, Mike? I'll tell you, I'm glad you asked. This is a good question. We're going to do it one person, one family at a time. 
That's our focus. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. So that's where we're going to live. Is your commitment to God what it needs to be? Where does your strength come from? Second, your position in God. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 13. Anytime you hear a pastor say it a few times, he's got to find his place. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I want you to hear what God says about this man called David. Acts 13, verse 22. And when God, he, meaning God, had removed him, meaning King Saul, God raised up David to be Israel's king, of whom God testified. Here it is. You should highlight this. You should underline this in your Bibles. Don't forget this passage. God says this, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Now, I want you to do something for me. Line through David's name and write your name there. Put your name there and listen to what it says. God says, I have found in Mike, the son of Wilbur, a man, dot, dot, dot. Sometimes I can't sleep at night because I wonder how God would describe me. Has that ever crossed your mind? How would Jesus describe you? He's having a meal with his father, and afterwards they're sitting on the throne, and God looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks at God, and Jesus says, Father, <coughs> do you know, Preston, a man, dot, 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 what would he say? If he's describing you, what would he say? You see, God called David a man after his own heart, and God said that David will do all my will. Will you? Are you willing to do all of God's will? Look at verse 3. David says, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. David knew God. David loved God. David pursued God. David trusted God. David worshipped God. And that is why God said that David was a man after his own heart. Go to Psalm chapter 96 and look at verse 4. Here, David's writing another song of worship to the Lord. And in Psalm 96 verse 4, David says, For great is Yahweh, Jehovah, the self-existent eternal God, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Can I just tell you today that God is sovereign? Are we okay? Can I just tell you, when you truly believe that God is sovereign, you are standing on solid ground. Can I just share something with you? This is not radical. It may seem that way, but it's not. But can I just tell you, I don't fear COVID-19. COVID-19 is important. It's significant. It's something we should watch because it's impacting human lives. But can I tell you something? COVID-19 does not dictate what I do in ministry. And as your pastor, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to urge you to move forward in this season of COVID-19. Because COVID-19 does not control the pace of ministry our Heavenly Father does. I'm going to ask you to trust in God so much so that we will no longer put it in park waiting on COVID-19 to change. What if, ladies and gentlemen, what if COVID-19 doesn't change? What if it stays right where it is for the next five years? Are we going to continue to be in this posture? I can't do that. I won't do that. This is the perfect opportunity. God has given us a golden platter and he's laid it before the church. And this is what he's saying. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men and women and children. This is our moment to take Jesus into the community, to meet people's needs as best we can to love on them and to show them that God loves them and wants a relationship with them 
And I promise you, when we go out into the community and we love people in the name of Jesus, they will respond. I don't know about you, but the state is not going to control what I do in ministry. God is. Now, now, if you believe God is sovereign, here's the radical fall. Then God has allowed COVID-19 to be here. Now ask yourself, why? Why is COVID-19 all over the globe? We've not seen anything like it in my lifetime. Why is it that America has received more cases of COVID-19 than any other country on the face of the earth, except maybe China, and they won't tell us the truth either way? Now think about this. Why is it that we have this virus and our leadership is freaking out? We may not even go to school in the fall. Football is canceled and I'm crying. I love football. The SEC is where it's at. 16 weeks a year, I get to put on my red and root for Bama and say, roll tide. You know what? We may not even get a chance to do that this year. And here's the church. And God has given the church a great opportunity in this season of uncertainty to provide certainty. To give the world peace in the midst of the chaos. When I get here next month, we are going to start moving forward. And I want you to come with me. And together, we're going to be safe. We're going to be practical. We're going to protect but we're going to do ministry. Next month, we're going to start opening up ministry again here on our campus. And by God's will and His grace, we're going to start meeting together again like we used to. And if you feel comfortable coming, you come. If you don't feel comfortable coming, I'm going to love you anyway, and our staff is going to love you anyway while you sit in your living room. And then when it's safe for you to come, you know you can join us. But we're going to move forward for Jesus. Even if we have to wear the mask that I hate wearing. We're going to do this and we're going to have fun and we're going to live. Notice that God is sovereign. Now look at your position in God. Can I just tell you, there are only two positions in God. There are only two types of people in our world. One is the person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the Bible, that person is called Christian. Two is a person who does not have a relationship with God. And in the Bible, that person is called non-Christian. See, there are only two types of people in the world. David is a person who knows his position in God. He is Christian. He knows who God is and he's standing on God the rock. Now, look at verse 4 and 5. The cords of death encompass me, David says. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. David was a warrior. He knew what death was. Every time he fought, the men on his left and on his right fell. Many died. David was not a stranger to death. That's what you hear him talking about here. He has been so close to death on so many different occasions from people who have snuck up and tried to kill him. And yet God shielded and protected David. David knows what death is like. For me, as a soldier, I have seen death up close and personal when I served in the army. I know what it looks like. It has a certain look. It has a certain smell. As a pastor, I have seen death often. Can I tell you? Our God has saved us. We have a relationship with Him. And death sets us free. To live in paradise with our Heavenly Father. Death does not end the fight. It just simply delivers us to live. Billy Graham said, When you come to my funeral, don't grieve, for I am more alive than I've ever been before. And he was right. David understands that because David's position in God is firm. Third, as we look at where does your strength come from, we see your commitment to God. You must choose whom you will serve and whom you will take refuge in. Your position in God. What will God say about you when He describes you? And third, your condition in God. 
Look at verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. David called upon God. In every season of life, I want to encourage you to stay close to God. Stay close to God. When things are great, stay close to God. But don't forget who He is. Over the years, I've had friends who have told me, Mike, sometimes I wish that things weren't good and I wasn't on that mountaintop because oftentimes I get complacent when things are really good. When life is perfect, oftentimes I forget the one who made it perfect. Oftentimes I stop reading the Bible and I stop spending time alone with God and I become complacent. When things are good, don't forget who God is. And then when things are bad, stay close to God. But let me give you a word of caution. Do not treat God like a vending machine. As a pastor, I oftentimes will have men and women come into my office for counseling and they will sit down and they will talk with me and they will tell me their life story and how they got to that point where they're broken and their lives are shattered and they're in despair. And then I'll ask a few questions. So would you tell me, when was the last time you sat down and talked to God? This week, perhaps? They'll shake their head. So can you tell me how long it's been since you talked with God? And their heads will bow almost all the time. Their shoulders will slump over. Their countenance will fall. And they'll say something like, I don't know the last time I talked with God. So well, tell me, what has God taught you this week as you've read the Bible? And their heads and their countenance still fall. And they will say, Mike, I haven't read the Bible in quite a while. I'll say, well, tell me. How sweet is the fellowship where you worship? Well, I haven't been in church in quite a while. See, when things are bad and your life is falling apart, you know the natural tendency? Satan convinces us that God doesn't have time for us, or we don't need to go to God. God really can't fix us. And so in that season, when things are falling apart, then they pray then we pray. And then we get angry at God because God doesn't answer our prayers. And we will scream and we will shout, God, why aren't you listening to me? Why are my prayers bouncing off of the ceiling and coming back down? Don't you hear me? Why have you forgotten me? The reality, God's never moved. But we have. My friends, you can't treat God like a vending machine. Notice what David gives us here. He gives us a beautiful picture. He says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. That's good. We should. He says, to my God, I cried for help. That's great. He knows where to go. From this temple, from God's temple, God heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. We're going to spend a couple minutes on this because I want you to understand what God listens to when you pray. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. This is worth opening up for a few moments. Matthew chapter 7, I want you to look at verse 7. Jesus is speaking. Jesus gives us three simple things we should do in prayer. Number one, Jesus says, ask, and it will be given you. You see, when you come to God in prayer, come to God in humility. I need your help, Father. I was praying that this morning. Father, I need your help. I'm about to stand in front of your people and open your word. You've given me the awesome privilege and the amazing responsibility to tell them what your word says. I need your help. Please help me. Don't let me mess this up. Jesus is saying, ask and it will be given you. When you are humble, when you are broken, when you are truly depending upon God, he will help you. Second, Jesus says, seek. You should underline that word. Seek and you will find. How hard are you looking for Jesus? How hard are you looking for God's will in your life? 
Well, Mike, that's a big subject. I really don't know what God's will is. Can I tell you? The Bible gives it to you in two verses. Genesis 2.15, if you break down the Hebrew, the Bible says this. God put man in the garden to worship and obey God. God put you in a place called Lakeland, Florida, in a church called KBC, to worship and obey God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now you understand God's will for your life. You are to worship and obey God in everything you do, whether it's the CEC or whether it is you are, whether it's the gas station or the restaurant where you serve in the executive office you work from, whatever it is, you are to do it for the glory of God. You do that and you will understand God's will for your life. I guarantee it, I promise it, because God does. Third, Jesus says, ask, seek, and then he says, knock, and it will be opened. Perseverance is what Jesus is saying here. There are three answers when you pray. Yes, no, and silence. Sometimes, in the silence, God just wants to know if you will continue to come to Him. My mom and dad, I was born and raised in Denellan, just up the road. I was born in Ocala, but was raised in Denellan. My mom and dad didn't have a clue who God was. They were legalists. They were pharisaical. They were good moral people and they taught me right from wrong. And dad was a strong disciplinarian, if you understand what I'm saying. But they raised me well. They loved me well. But they could not give me what they did not have. They did not have a relationship with God. One day in 1979, God saved me. Told you a little bit about that. Tampa Bay Stadium, Buccaneer Stadium. God gave me life. For 25 years. From the first week. God saved me, I began praying for my mom and dad's salvation. After the first year, I began crying out to God, God, what am I doing wrong? Why aren't you saving my mom and dad? God, please move. After the fifth year, silence. The tenth year, silence. And I continued to pray. My wife was praying with me. My children when they were saved, was praying for grandma and grandpa. 25 years, and I got the call. For the first time in my life, I was telling Kaylee and the guys about this last night, when God saved my daddy, my daddy was a different man. And for the first time in my life, I heard my father say three words, I love you. Before Jesus, my daddy could never say those words. But after Jesus, wow. I want to encourage you, in the silence, wait on God. In the silence, continue to pray to God. You see, David is saying, man, I know, I know who my God is. Go to 1 John chapter 3. We'll close here. 1 John chapter 3. I want you to understand the power of prayer and what David is trying to communicate. Here, God communicates it in a little bit different fashion. But the message is clear. Verse 21, 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. In other words, when you're walking in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, He knows your heart. You know that He knows your heart and your mind. And you're in a right relationship with Him. He moves in your prayer life. Verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from God. Okay, now before you hesitate, listen to the caveat. The caveat is the next phrase. Because we keep His commandments and we do what pleases Him. If you want God to move in your prayer life like He moved in David's, then you must obey what God says in His Word. Don't treat Him like a vending machine. Treat Him like the God that He is. Honor Him with your life, with what you do and with what you say. Obey Him and do what the Bible says and He will please God and He will move in your prayer life. Can I get an amen? I'm not preaching if He is. Isn't that truth? 
That's simple truth that we can stand on. And David understands his condition in God. He understands he's nothing, even though he's now king of Israel. But God is everything, and he knows that God has put him where he is in his life. Where do you go to find your strength? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I know that there are those here in this room who do not have a relationship with God. I know that you rely upon yourself for your own strength. And I know you understand, for those of you who have lived long enough, you understand your strength is not enough. God brought you here today so that you could hear your strength can come from Him. God loves you. I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come down and to take my hand and say, Mike, I want God in my life. Man, I'd love to tell you how to do that. I'd love to pray with you so that you can leave this place and know that you're not alone. For those of you here who have a relationship with our Father, just want to encourage you. Stay close to God. Let Him be enough for you. And God will protect, defend, watch over, fill you, and He will give you purpose in your life. And He will open your eyes and allow you to see what you need to see from Him. I'm going to ask you this morning, this altar will be open for you. If you need to come down and talk with Him, you come down and pray. And you'll have that opportunity. If you want to stay in your seat, you can do that. For those of you in the parking lot, and those of you watching from home, I want to invite you to listen to the voice of God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, but you want to know Him as Lord, and you want to accept His offer of life through Jesus, I'm going to give you my telephone number. I want you to call me. And I will pray with you and encourage you. And then we will get you connected to our faith family. Here's my number. Please write it down. Because I want you to call me. So that we can rejoice and pray together. And I can help you in your journey in becoming a child of God. My phone number is 903-570-2201. Call me. And I'll pray with you and help you and encourage you any way I can. Get you connected to the staff, Grant, Matt, Preston, so that we can love on you and support you. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come. Father, thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our rock and our strength and our fortress. Thank you for being